walk, seen a couple of cops with the last of a talk. Hands in the air, I'm not drawing a threat. Y'all got a moment, cause I got a question. Whole lot of chaos, so what's the solution? One cop replied, boy, it sure isn't looting. It's the rebuttal, what should I be doing? Peacefully protesting, where's the improvement? Cops are like, listen, bro, we do the video. Don't remember, Grace or should be held accountable. I reply, well, they know cops are like, I don't know. I'm not the judge, I am just the patrol. The only position that I can control is the way that I choose to patrol. I see the shooting, and what's am I doing? You see my badge, and you get to a screaming. I'm at these riots, I fear for my life. Hoping I make it to powder and knife. Y'all really kill me because of my badge. Under my uniform, I'm still a badge. I see a tango with look in his eye. Truthfully believe what he's doing is right. But how do you feel when you're with us in class? The perfect mask is the people with class. If I were to kill you, I get 25. If you were to kill me, would you see a trap? The only police are the ones that decide. We're sister and kill for the people like mine. The one that took this is the only proof that I would be civilized. I'll say I'm civil rights built in a maze with masks on the gas. But there's no solution. We don't need a solution. It's a revolution. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are so happy to have you all here and for you to participate. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Neufeld, and I had the, have the pleasure of introducing this amazing team. Um, I am the executive producer and, and executive producer on this film, but I'm also the CEO and founder of Strat Labs, which is a social impact marketing agency. We work with social entrepreneurs and social causes to create change in this crazy world. So that is how we have gotten to know the Enough team. And I am just so proud and excited to be part of this and play a small role in the incredible work that they have done to get this film out into the world. And I know that they're so excited to share it with you all here today. Um, starting this morning, it's got some incredible views and we're just thrilled that you all have tuned in to be with us. So before we get started, I just wanna um, lay a couple ground rules out and give some people information about how you can ask questions when we open up the Q&A. Um, we have a wonderful moderator who I'm gonna introduce in a minute, and he is going to um, be doing the questioning uh, for the first half hour or so, 45 minutes, and then we're gonna open it up. You'll need to put your questions in the YouTube live chat 
and there you'll have to include your name and I'd like you to include also where you're from so we can see where you are um, tuning in from. That would be great. And then we will get those questions over to Chris who's going to be moderating and then we'll get them answered by the panelists. So feel free also, if the question is directed at one panelist in particular, please note that so that um, Chris can ask it and it's for everyone, that's fine too. So we'll be moderating that chat throughout. You can enter those questions at any time and we're gonna pull out as many as we possibly can. Um, if we're not able to get to your question, I bet Nathan and Slane, the artist and filmmaker would be happy to stay on for a few extra minutes to continue the conversation or even better, you guys can join us in Clubhouse this afternoon, which will start at four Pacific time. So with that, I would really like to introduce our incredible moderator um, and panelist as well. He, his name is Chris Jenkins and he's an award-winning journalist, producer and executive producer. His work has covered politics, poverty, and social policy, policy over a 19 year career as a reporter and editor at the Washington Post. He's also an independent filmmaker um, and the writer of a YouTube original film called Trapped C Cash Bail in America. He's also the executive producer of Mavericks and Brother Speak. We are so happy and honored to have Chris with us today. It is truly, truly um, an honor to, to have you moderate this panel. So thank you. Thank and you. next up, we have Nathan Zanga, who is the talent behind Enough. Nathan, this is a, Nathan is a first generation Congolese American storyteller. He hails from Seattle and he wears all of his influences on his sleeve, blending hip hop with elements of folk, R&B, soul, gospel, and musical theater. Enough, as you saw, hopefully earlier today, marries Nathan's heart gripping lyrics with powerful visuals as he searches for understanding in a world in need of love. So amen to that. Um, next up joining us is Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. So my, Dr. Dyson is a Georgetown University sociology professor, a New York Times contributing opinion writer and a contributing editor of the New Republic and ESPN's The Undefeated website. He's the author of multiple bestsellers and Dr. Dyson's latest book, Long Time Coming, Reckoning with Race in America is the new addition to an impressive body of work. Next up, we have Caleb Slane, who is the filmmaker, the director, and the creative vision behind the filming up. Slane first gained notoriety at age 20, along, and that's how old Nathan is, with the haunting short doc, It Ain't Over, which premiered at South by Southwest and Telluride. And within five years, his collective works had received millions of internet views, six Vimeo staff picks, and has been used for teaching materials at USC, NYFA, and USF. Um, in 2016, not that long ago, Slane launched an experimental writing app called Flow State, which garnered praise from Wired, The Bird, GQ, and dozens more. And his film Demon was awarded Best Narrative Short at the Austin Film Festival in a surreal virtual reality collaboration with Eminem. Marshall from Detroit premiered at Sundance in 2019, when we still had Sundance. Um, and then I also would love to introduce Chelsea Miller, who's not on yet, but she will be joining us shortly. And she is a Columbia University graduate. Chelsea Miller is a 24 year old Brooklyn native and the leading voice in youth activism. Chelsea's the co-founder of Freedom March NYC, a youth protest and policy group on the front lines pushing for reform across the nation. She has addressed thousands of people in speaking engagements that include Madison Square Garden, Yale University, and most recently March on Washington. You may have seen her in New York Magazine, Forbes, Vogue, CNN, BT, and most recently Rolling Stone. In 2016, she actually worked in the Obama White House as one of the youngest interns on criminal justice reform and urban economic opportunity. And she's co-founder and CEO of Women Everywhere Belief Inc., a national organization training women and girls of color to be civic and corporate leaders. And she'll be joining us shortly. So with all of that, thank you again so much for being here, for allowing us to show you this film and to share it with us. And I am gonna turn it over to Chris Jenkins, our moderator. Lizzie, thanks very much. And uh, thanks again for having me. Um, you know, it's an incredible honor uh, to be able to lead this conversation about this film uh, and Nate's music. Um, you know, I was incredibly moved by both the film um, and the music, of course, of Nate, but that Nate, Nate and Kayla birthed. Um, it just hits on so many essential issues that we're going through as a country that we've always gone through in this moment um, since its founding. And 
you know, it just, it kind of hits hard uh, for me, uh, at least, um, like some of the greatest protest art, um, whether it's Hamilton, um, This is America by Donald Glover, um, the Thomas work of James Baldwin. I mean, all those artists in that work timelessly sort of came up for me when I saw um, enough. And so having said that, um, I just wanted to have started sort of an intro conversation with the artists uh, to talk a little bit about how they got together, how this all came together. Um, so Nate, let's uh, let's start with you. Um, and first, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, where you grew up, uh, where your parents are from. Um, I, I think I heard you're from Seattle. Um, tell me a little bit about your artistic impulses and when they began. But tell us a little bit about us as, as you as a person, also as an artist. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for doing this and being a part of this. Uh, um, I'm Nathan. I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. Um, my parents are Congolese immigrants, so my dad came over here in like 1980, and my mom came over here in the early 90s, and um, I have an older sister, an older brother, and a little brother, and um, yeah, we were, we just always, my mom always had Congolese music playing in the house, or she had like, we were driving in the car, and she would always have Spirit 105.3, so she was always playing Christian rock, and she was she put us in church choir immediately when we were old enough type thing. So I've been singing in choir since I was five, and I started doing um, I started doing musical theater for a long time, um, uh, in uh, like fifth or sixth grade, and um, I did that through high school, and I think that, and um. Uh, meeting, uh, go, starting the Prodigy Camp, um, like in learning about storytelling there, um, that really helped my growth in writing. Yeah, and, and tell us a little bit about, um, you know, when you wrote uh, these two songs that was the backbone um, of Enough the Film. Um, I think I've heard uh, one of the songs was written in 2016. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about how you came to write the first song, Truce, uh, and then uh, Enough, I think, was written last year. Yeah. Um, the, I started writing Truce. Um, I was 17, and um, I had just been invited to this storytelling summer camp. So I was learning every day about storytelling, but it would the summer where um, I checked my phone one of the days. I checked my phone the one of the days in um, Philando Castile had just been murdered. And I checked my phone the next day and Alton Sterling, Sterling was murdered. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm sitting here worried, just like thinking about it. And I start writing the first couple of verses and um, the over the weekend, the like six police officers are murdered in Baton Rouge, and I'm just thinking about everything. And um, I was learning about storytelling at camp, so that's what I decided to write about. That's where I was at in that moment. Hmm. And um, I put truce out, and I was like, "This is how I can try to say something in uh, in the midst of." when we all feel super lost and we don't know what's going on right now, we like, we like, this has been going on for centuries, but like we, like it was so upfront in that moment. So like, that's what I felt I had to do. But um, in three, four years later, get sent the George Floyd video and it's just like, nothing has changed in it, I felt like a lot of people my age and a lot of like just no a lot of people in general I felt how a lot of people in general felt I just felt mm -hmm. tired it felt like this kept on happening and we knew what the results were going to be nobody was going to be held accountable mm -hmm. and I felt tired and um I started writing it on like I started writing it on a drive and I started writing it on a cabin trip and I started having conversations with my friends and I started having mm -hmm. conversations with people at protests and I started just, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, I decided to, and I finished it and I played it for my uh, my camp family and they were like, we gotta, we gotta shoot a video for this. 
Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly moving and insightful. Uh, both songs are. Um, and, you know, for you, Caleb, you uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about the incredible way in which you and Nate came together. Um, talk to us a little bit about um, just the artistic process for you, how you and Nate came together to turn what so these songs into what became now this film. Um, and it's an incredibly, you know, uh, moving uh, story in terms of how quickly you had to do it, under the conditions you had to do it. Uh, so talk to talk to us a little bit about how it all came together. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, and Chris, really been a pleasure working with you on all this and, and everything that you're doing, man. So respect you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think like uh, Nate and I, we, we met at camp and my first impression of Nate was really um, seeing him on stage, which is if you haven't seen Nate on stage, uh, you should see him on stage because uh, he's uh, he's pretty electrifying. Um, and um, he, it's like he was sort of his performance and his energy was in, in like my body uh, after seeing him. And so that always stayed with me. Um, and then uh, a couple of years later, when um, Rick, who runs the camp, you know, kind of reached out and he was like, hey, you know, Nate, Nate's in Chicago. And he, I, he wrote this, he kind of, he wrote the song and, you know, camps called off and I think you should listen to it. I think we should do something. And I was super busy and it didn't, it didn't really make sense at the time. And I, I told Rick, no, that I, I couldn't. Um, and then uh, uh, Rick followed up by sending me the tracks and he said, well, just, just listen um, to them. And I think the most exciting thing as an artist is like, whether you're in a studio, whether you're producing music or whether you're on set, whatever, is reacting to other people's art. And um, obviously I, I was, you know, this was, this was at um, in the middle of the summer after so many conversations around a lot of this stuff um, with, with my friends, uh, with my black friends, with my white friends, with my coastal friends, with my Midwest friends, discussing um, what was going on in the country in terms of policing. What, what does it, what does it take to make some, what does it take to make this better? Um, what, what, how did we get here? Uh, and um to have good art like that come through music that just sort of was alive, that kind of activated and spoke to things that, that, that was nuanced and thoughtful, but just honest. Um, it gave, it started filling me with ideas. And that's the most exciting part. It's like when, the, when art kind of creates a reaction of art. Um, and so I just channeled into his tracks and just listened to them and um, listened to, you know, the growth that I could hear between these two time periods, the, the change in that and, um, and kind of started to put ideas and images um, that came to my head around that and around the conversations that I had with my friends. I had with my friends who are, you know, U Ugandan um, and who didn't grow up in America, my friends who are from Detroit and who did, and, you know, like, um, you know, different experiences of being black in America. Um, and so this was all sort of present for me. And, um, and then from there, I feel like Nate's music was just kind of like, just kind of pumping this spirit through where ideas started coming out. And then from there, once there was a collection of them, it was like, listen, let, I want to, I'm going to hand this to Nate and see if this is lands for him. Does this feel true? Does this feel like, you know, does this line up? Um, and uh, he was super excited about it. And then that started this sort of back and forth process of like, you know, going, you know, uh, 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 twisting something, bouncing it to Nate, seeing if it feels right, coming back and kind of, you know, and as we narrowed down to even shooting, we were on set and sometimes we'd just walk away from set and have a little conversation about something like, does this feel right? Like, are we, is this really what we're trying to do here? What does this mean? And then kind of renegotiate or change. And sometimes, you know, like I had, I thought we were going one way and Nate would say, like, I don't, you know, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Like, it doesn't quite feel right. And we'd kind of talk until it, it felt right to both of us. We both felt good about that. Yeah. And this was done in the height of the summer, right? In, in August. Uh, so we're in the middle of this latest freedom, freedom summer um, after George Floyd, uh, the reckoning around Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, so many others. Um, and so everything I imagine was, was raw and fresh in terms of the artistic process, in terms of what was going on around you as artists. Uh, just tell us briefly a little bit about just the filmmaking that went on. Um, I mean, Nate, you could add anything to that too. Uh, but I mean, it's a, it's, uh, I mean, doing any film production is hard and doing a film production without any money is tough and doing a film production around really sensitive stuff, um, at a sensitive time, especially race in America is extra hard. There's just so many considerations and things. If you're compassionate and thoughtful that you want to, you don't want to mess it up. You want, you want to, um, you want to get it right. 
Um, and then on top of that, you know, <laughs> it's essentially a big family from a camp, which is wild because there's all these young people who are coming and joining to help with this. And we're trying to make like, you know, it, the ambition just kept sort of growing for it. Um, but the beauty of it is that we'd, we've spent years at this camp. I've spent years mentoring at this camp. Nate spent years mentoring at this camp around people learning to kind of be in the trenches with them, um, learning to go through um, uh, really, really uh, tough production schedules um, when you, you just have to rely on people. You have to know them. You have to trust them. Um, and like, I, I don't think this film could have existed with a normal film crew that you just hire. Like, I don't think it would have been possible um, to look around a set and, 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 and know people's hearts and their souls and what you've been through together over years and, and been through like for the sake of helping kids, you know, like Nate and I are out there because we love, you know, the, the journey of, of helping to foster artists and their vulnerabilities and their stories into being better artists of the future. And um, so, I, yeah, I just think that we, it was, it was so hard on, I won't get into all the production details because uh, I'll have PTSD, but, um, <laughs> but the, tr but the truth is, is like, I mean, the, I think that the reason that we survived it was because of um, a sense of family within, yeah. within the camp. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dice, let me come to you and welcome and thanks for being here with us. Um, you know, you've written extensively about youth, black identity, power structures that designed to limit African-American movement and freedom. Um, but I just wanted to get from you because it's such a moving and powerful piece. Um, for starters, what came up for you um, based on all that you have written about, spoken about, researched, experienced? Um, what comes up for you in watching this film that touches on so many themes so beautifully over its 13 minutes? Yeah, well, thanks a lot for having me and thank you for your expert guidance and, uh, you know, facilitating of this conversation. Uh, it was extraordinary because um, I had the same feeling uh, as, as my beloved brother because I had just finished my book on Barack Obama, writing that. And I got the notice of Philando Castile and then in quick succession, the notice of um, Alton Sterling. And my response was to write an op-ed. I just stayed up all night, just pouring the grief, the anguish, the trauma out on paper, you know, my keyboard. And then it became um, an op-ed in the New York Times. And then an op-ed led to my book, a New York Times bestseller, Tears We Cannot Stop, A Sermon to White America. So when I watch this film, I see the, the power, the beauty of image, and image married to story, and story as an instrument of introspection, of examination, and to feel the textures and tonalities of tensions between, on the one hand, the unmitigated truth, the unadulterated truth, the unmitigated trauma that one experiences, the hostility, the resentment of one's blackness, of one's black male identity, and the degree to which that has been criminalized in this culture, and then the backdrop of grace, of forgiveness, of struggle, of religion, of identity, and you know, when I watch this, you know, being a Baptist preacher myself for the last 41 years, um, I often see how white evangelicals distort the religious truth, in my mind at least, um, undercut the trajectory of transformation that any religious narrative might bring by too quickly surrendering to a vapid notion of reconciliation, right? And we hear some of that stuff going on now. Let's just reconcile, let's just reconcile. Well, dude, you gotta have truth before you reconcile. You gotta have justice before you reconcile. You gotta have you know, an engagement with the existential misery unleashed by an orange apparition that besieged the horizon of American culture before you can, you know, as Dr. King said, integrate into a burning house. Don't wanna do that. So, I, 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 plus my man is just such a dope MC. There you go. <laughs> He's just a dope go. MC. <laughs> like, like I, you know, I was sitting down, I was like, all right, I gotta do this. Oh, 
oh, wait, 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 homeboy got skills, right? And then just the way he's talking, right, the, the, the way in which it flows. So the magnetism and the charisma of this beautiful young man uh, just seized me. And we got to tell the story. I got another book I've written since, or well, a few, but, you know, long time coming, re Reckoning with Race in America, I got that, you know, out now. But this is the visual accompaniment. This is the adjunct uh, to that, so to speak, in my own mind. Like we're partners in an artistic enterprise to articulate the vulnerability, the rage, the trauma, the hurt, the pain, um, the misery, trying to figure out what the heck to do in the face of the extraordinary assault upon the black body. So. It was dope, it was fresh, it was beautiful. Uh, I love the, the fact that you got, right, the immigrant, quote, identity, black immigrant. You know, people tend to forget when they have all these immigration stories, they, 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 they'd be forgetting about Africa. They'd be forgetting about the shithole countries. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so the thing is, is that when you see uh, the ways in which African immigrant identities have been negotiated in this postmodern space where there has been tremendous simpatico between and tensions among, you know, African American and Africans in America and then African American to that degree, problematizing that dyad in a way that Obama pointed to, but that is, you know, a generational um force to be dealt with and a generational problem to be taken up. All of that coming to bear upon this, but seeing the universality of certain forms of that blackness and the black Atlantic, mm -hmm. you know, that they talk about. So it was, it was fresh. I loved it. Uh, it sparked me. Uh, it gave me a sense that, yeah, this younger generation is uh, doing their thing. And this young brother is especially gifted. Yeah. Especially gifted is right. And, you know, one of the things that, um, it came up for me what you just said, uh, Dr. Dyson, is the vulnerability that comes out. And so I wanted to actually go back to Nate for a second. Nate, what was it like to see yourself at 18, 19, looking back on yourself at age 11 or 12, going through this process? I mean, I know part of the camp that you are a part of is this 5,000 days um, uh, program where you tell stories about uh, over the course of many, many months and years about yourself. But in the process of doing this, um, what was it like just to see yourself at age 11? Um, you know, round face glasses, talking about your little brother, um, you know, then talking about, you know, your parents and all that. What was it like uh, just to go through that and see yourself reflected back at you in that vulnerable state? Uh, um, I just wanted to say real quick first, uh, Dr. Dyson, yeah. thank you so, so, so much, man. It really, really, really does a lot. Everything that you just said. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Watching, I hadn't seen those videos at all. Yeah. The first time I had, the first time I watched the film was the first time I had seen the majority of those videos. Wow. So like it was, it was it tripped me out at first. I was just like, wow, I'm like I was embarrassed. I was like, I was I laughed at myself. I was embarrassed by myself. I was like, oh man, I re kind of remember when I was saying what I said that. I kind of remember when I said that. And um, I don't know, it was odd, but um, it was cool that um, the, um, that Rick just gave me an opportunity to, to like see myself and like the opportunity to be like, ah, nah, the dots have been connected since I was 11. Like I've, like I'm supposed, like I've known I'm supposed to do something. I've known I'm supposed to be somebody. So like, it's great that Rick gave me a tool to like, continuously remind myself of that like who better to tell yourself to be the best version of yourself than little you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um you know one of the thing, one of the concepts that we've been playing with as we talked about this uh, putting this form together is vulnerability um and being vulnerable um as a uh, young man young black man um vulnerability in the american context amongst men is often not nurtured uh, in all communities, um, it's often, um, you know, seen also in Black American communities. Of, you know, Black men are not supposed to be vulnerable ever. Uh, but you, uh, in a in a real way, have you know sort of shattered any of that quote unquote stereotype. 
Um, is that something natural that came for you? Or tell us a little bit about just your notions of being open, your heart, your mind, um, just as it relates to you personally. No, um, I've, uh, I've been, like, I've been, like, I used to go to leadership camps when I was in high school. I was always, like, being pushed these ideas of, like, giving, of serving the world by giving yourself, being able to give yourself and give as much of yourself as possible. So, um, I see being vulnerable as just allowing people to see you and allowing people to see themselves in you because you can see yourself in anybody that you have a conversation with. And I think, and I think once we decide that we're going to see ourselves in every single one of like, regardless of who you are, we're going to see ourselves in you. We're going to choose to do right by them because I see myself in you. Mm. Uh, just as a reminder to uh, all of us, folk, all the folks in our audience, please feel free to um, drop in any questions um, that you may have for any of our panelists or on any things that we're talking about or things we haven't brought up yet. Um, you know, we've got a lot of time here just to really go through some of the things that are really important to filmmakers, to Nate and to Dr. Dyson and soon Chelsea. Um, Dr. Dyson, let me come back to you for one second. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that um, you know, we're obviously seeing now with the new administration is a heavy focus on politics, that politics mm -hmm. uh, will get us out of some of the things that we've experienced for the last four years under the previous administration, um, mm -hmm. moving bills around and, and uh, executive orders and all that. But um, t tell us a little bit about, at least in the context of this film, what art can do that politics can't in our current moment. Um, both, uh, both for African Americans, for Black and Brown folks, for marginalized folks, but also societally and globally. What can art do in our moment where we are in the middle of this pandemic, still dealing with racial violence and all those sorts of things? Um, what what can art do that politics can't? Which there's so much focus on politics right now. Well, at the first and at the last and in between, art can tell the truth, right? I mean, there's so many truths that are compromised in politics for a variety of reasons, and I understand why it's a complicated world to have the unmitigated truth, to have a truth that without recognition of context and surrounding emphases that a particular revelation might at that particular moment disturb, comity, C-O-M-I-T-Y, balance, and a kind of, um, you know, respectful engagement that we saw for the last four years was totally eviscerated. They ain't care about it. I don't give a darn. But one of the reasons that people for a variety of reasons dug that dude is that whatever you said, you knew he was saying what he really believed. It wasn't no filter through uh, high and mighty noble aspiration and the discourse of the founding fathers. You're fat, you're stupid, you're dumb, I hate you, you're black, you're Mexican. There was no question that in, in that way, uh, we saw the truth get out. But what we learned is that truth without context may be just as destructive as a constructed lie, mm. as a mendacity that has been fashioned on the anvil of serious, you know, um, a kind of serious engagement with the world and trying to determine what you're going to withhold and what you're going to give. So you can say, hey, truth, but nothing is true without context. Nothing is true without explanation. Art supplies the necessary explanation for the truth that is revealed. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you know, when we're having all these conversations about policing and whether we're going to defund the police, whether we're going to <clears throat> hold them accountable for the stuff they did. When we look at what's happening now in the aftermath of the Capitol uh, fiasco and white brothers and sisters who gathered there in anger uh, at what they perceived to be the denial of their legitimate right as American citizens, but it rested upon denying other American citizens their right to the franchise to vote. So in that sense, what looked appealing at first, oh, we're gonna tell the truth. Art can tell the truth or politics is gonna tell the truth. Yeah, but whose truth? In what context? From what perspective? 
And the beauty of art is that it anchors its particular truth in an existential, a personal commitment, and also one that it sees as necessary to link up to the broader world, to be a bridge between one's personal perception and the politics of the broader world, the society in which you live, right? So that when, when Brother Nate is reflecting on his African and American identity, the tensions between him and his younger brother, his growing and evolving sense of self-awareness, his own, what he just spoke here about, it was poured into him the belief that he would do something significant or special. The, the performative characteristic of that is crucial. And what I love about this, there have been, and I understand why people say, well, you know, uh, we're just into performative allyship. I take a little umbrage at uh, umbrage at the at the notion of uh, performative being demonized. Now I, I understand why, because it can be, but there's a tremendous dimension of performance we shouldn't overlook here, right? John Lewis was performing when he's on that bridge in Edmund Pettus. Martin Luther King Jr. said, "Oh, we got a white bigot over here. What about if we got this dude so pissed that he would like turn on some hoses and sick some dogs on us, right? He wasn't trying to provoke." them to hurt black people, but he knew inevitably, given the fact that this guy was a goon, racially speaking, that it was predictable that once he was offended by the black presence and resistance, he would do something horrendous, and he did, and it was a performative element there. There was performance. There was theatricality. All of this above, uh, stop being performative, and it's merely performative. You're missing a dimension that is crucial that the performance of identity, the performance of justice is critical. The performance of truth, that's what I was trying to get at more inelegantly earlier when I said that, it, you know, politics claims to be, you know, Donald Trump claimed to be telling the truth, but you weren't really telling the truth. You were saying some stuff you believed and you were being honest about it and we appreciate it, but it destroyed the country nearly. Because in your performance of, in your telling of, the truth as you saw it, you were you were just ripping the heart of American democracy apart. And what I see this young man doing, and Brother Caleb too, is suturing the wounds of our awareness with the kind of stitching, the artistic stitching that examines the gaping holes and injuries on the body politic, the body racial, and art as that stitching together so that performances that are put forward have the possibility of making us think about stuff in a way that politics never will, mm -hmm. uh, feelings that politics never will get to, um, opinions, ways of being, uh, overcoming uh, traumatic distances between peoples and ethnicities and cultures and orientation, all of that stuff. Art seems to me to have the possibility to speak directly and without apology and in often an edifying sense to what we see going on. And it can be as honest as possible, as honest as the skills and talent of the very, um, you know, artist allows him or her to be. So I, I think that's what art can do that can give us something more powerful. I mean, Bob Dylan, Jay-Z, Beyonce, Joan Baez, you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat, right? There's something immediate that connects to the heart, that, that links the brain and the heart, that makes us reflect. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind, right? You can have a hundred speeches from John F. Kennedy or Robert F. Kennedy. Martin Luther King Jr., greater as a poet than many recognize, but an I Have a Dream speech can be condensed you know, to a Tupac song. Just the other day, I got lynched by some crooked cops. And to this day, them same cops on the beat getting major pay. But when I get my check, they taking tax out. So we paying the cops to knock the blacks out. This dude done reduce Marxist neo you know, economy to the notion that you're subsidizing your own oppression by subordinating your social conscience, right? To the expression of a ridiculing culture that refuses to recognize your humanity. All that in a lyric. So art, and his brother Nate did, I mean, I, I, again, when I say he's a dope MC, not just his flow and style, 
not just his chocolate charm and handsomeness, which is very winning and charismatic, but it's the way in which he's willing to, as you talked about earlier, be vulnerable and reveal. We see him growing. We Nothing more vulnerable than 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and how it starts with every cough, every exhale is also an exhaling of a year, is an expurgation of a kind of intense interior experience, not necessarily meant for the external world to see. And when he says just now, the first time I saw it is when I saw it. And then I'm seeing it now. He's experiencing it with us. That's the true meaning of that art. Didn't mean to go on, but that's sure. what I think art can do. That's why we have you here. <laughs> okay. So I think we're yeah. ready. Uh, I think Chelsea is here. Um, if I've got that right, um, I'm going to pull her up. Chelsea, you there? I, I am. Hey, there she is. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Um, you came in the middle of um, a classic uh, answer from Dr. Dyson, so I'm going to throw you right in and uh, and have you follow him. Just for starters, um, you've done a lot of great work, obviously, over the last year and uh, in the time that you were at Columbia and since you since you left. But um, one of the things that I was curious about when I read your bio, your bio. Um, was the work you're doing with, with women, um, with, with the female black body. And, um, but even actually, before I get to that, let me just start with a, a basic question for you. What came up for you um, when you saw this film? Uh, I think when we talked on Monday, we hadn't gotten a chance to talk a little bit about your thoughts mm -hmm. about the film. But um, I asked Dr. Dyson what his thoughts were about what came up for him because it's such a rich piece. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about what came up for you um, when you, when you saw the 13 minute piece enough and uh, how it connects to your work. Absolutely, so a lot of thoughts and I'm so happy that I got in as Mr. Dyson was unpacking it all because that felt like a word and like he was spitting bars within of itself. <laughs> but first and foremost, I think that when you talk about black children there is this tendency to criminalize and in a lot of ways um, create this adultification around black youth. And I think there's something to be said about being able to see, right, that journey of becoming. And I think that that's something that so many people can understand, right? Being young, trying to figure out your place in the world, trying to understand what that looks like, being introduced to larger conversations, right, around adulthood and pornography and, and sex and relationships and self, really, because that's what it comes down to and there's this part in the film where he says that he was becoming everything that he thought he wouldn't be and mm -hmm. I think that when we are so young there's this tendency to be so bright-eyed and so optimistic about the world and be intentional about being unapologetic and I think that Mr. Dyson also used that word right this unapologetic nature about living you know in abundance and I think that as you get older there are so many boxes that end up coming to confine you and there's a part where he's of course running from the police officer and you can't help but also be in that state of anxiety with him and an anxiety that in your childhood in a lot of ways you are supposed to be protected from but I also think there's an interesting parallel of the fact that even as a black child he was having dreams about being killed by the police Right. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean when reality sometimes penetrates that adolescence and the two merge? Right. And so it's this beautiful coming together of of stories. Um, there's something to be said about the art and the way that it is depicted and this idea of the blinded um, white figures that are pressing against him. And you have to wonder how blind are they really? Right. Um, so there's a lot of unpacking. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of feelings about the film, but it is powerful. Powerful. It is a testament. And the last thing that I would add is for someone who has spent a lot of time really unpacking the history of respectability politics and what it looks like within the Black community and the movement, I think there's something to be said about um, him being chased by an officer in a suit and tie, right? Um, mm. And that a symbol of the fact that it really doesn't matter where you are or who you are or, or your stature, right? Um, 
for your class or, or what you're wearing because there tends to be this image, right? When we talk about Trayvon Martin, the hoodie, the Skittles, the Arizona iced tea. Well, you can be someone in your car, you could be jogging like Ahmad, you could be in your house like Brianna Taylor, right? Um, you could be in your backyard like Stefan Clark, it doesn't matter. You could be coming home from work, right? In, in your uh, suit. So a lot of layers to it that I think is a testament to how how much humanity needs to be placed back into understanding the narratives. And when we talk about hashtags, realizing that there is so much history of, of the humanity and the families and the victims that are worth celebrating too. Um, and that that all comes together in this piece. Let's stick with you for a second because you mentioned Breonna Taylor and you know a lot of the last you know 10 years, I guess, starting with Trayvon Martin and going to Michael Brown, there's a lot of these issues of trauma and uh, the state the state violence against black bodies has been through the prism of black men, black boys. Um, but we saw last year how um, uh, Breonna Taylor's story, her tragic murder was really lifted up at, at the same level as some of the people we've come to know um, in all of our hashtags, what's Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin. Um, can you talk a little bit about just in your work, with the work that you've done with uh, young girls and young women um, in our communities, whether you think you're seeing a shift in how we're now also focusing on uh, the bodies of Black women and the trauma experienced by Black women, even if it's exactly the same as African-American men and their relations with the police. But is there a, a broader reckoning about extending this conversation around um, you know, state violence, uh, now to Black women as well. At least in the, in the, it's always been part of our conversation as people, but in sort of pop culture or uh, in mainstream conversation. Absolutely, so what I will definitely say about that is that Breonna Taylor's story exhumed the fact that Black women are still being killed at the hands of police. But this is nothing new because when we understand the history of even the policing system within our country that was initially designed as a slave catching institution, black women have always been targeted, right? And dehumanized by the hands of police. And the difference though, is that those stories oftentimes aren't exhumed even if you talk about black trans women, right? And the narratives around that. And so what I will say that with Breonna Taylor, there was an opportunity to show the world, the importance when we meant justice for Breonna Taylor, the fact that you can be in your home and they will paint you as a criminal and they will come out with false accusations about your character and who you are based on who you are affiliated with or who you may not even be affiliated with, right? And the ways in which the media will spin narratives for no other reason than to protect the carceral state, right? And that is what we've seen time and time again. And also worth noting is that when we talk about the abuse to prison pipeline and how that disproportionately impacts black women, when we talk about even from a state sanctioned violence perspective, ICE detention centers, just this past year, we saw the exhuming of what happened in Irwin, and it was Black women. It was Black women migrants, right? Immigrant Black women from Jamaica, et cetera, who blew the whistle. It was a Black nurse who was the whistleblower at Irwin Detention Center. Mm -hmm. And so that is really important in grounding the narrative that we can't even talk about just city policing, NYPD. We have to talk about federal policing on black and brown bodies and what that looks like and how it shows up and the curtains that are oftentimes used as a way to blind us to the realities of what is taking place. Um, and it all connects and it all ties together. And so what we've been seeing, what we will continue to see is that rise in making sure that those narratives are brought to light. And I'd also say that that is in large part due to the black woman organizers who have been on the front lines and who've been leading the movement, making sure that these names do not go unsaid or these stories do not go untold and unheard of. And so being super intentional about that. And then the last thing that I would add is that one of the questions that I get a lot is how does it feel being a black woman in the movement? 
movement, how does it feel being a black woman leading on the front lines? And to that point, it's important to know that black women have always been a part of the movement. Black women have always been central to the DNA of what it looks like when we talk about social justice, civil rights, everyone from Ida B. Wells to Harriet Tubman, right, to Coretta Scott. So we can go on and on, but that's really important. Shirley Chisholm, right, first Black person to run for president. And so it's really important for us to make sure that we highlight those who have come before us and show that in all of these spaces that we will rise um, in spite of and due to. Yeah, it's an excellent point. I mean, I think the, the word that you used a couple of times there, I think that's uh, pertinent here is exhume, that there are stories and, and, and experiences that are being lifted up, I think more now as, as it relates to the Black women experience, not only as leaders, I think many of us know that, but certainly as as uh, targets, uh, which is what uh, you mentioned. And just some of the research I've been doing recently, we all know about Tommy Smith and uh, John Carlos who put you know, shook their fists to the um, at the 1968 Olympics during the national anthem that they won uh, silver and bronze gold and, and bronze medals at the Olympics in 1968 in Mexico City and became icons. In actuality, as a black woman in 1959 who first uh, protested the uh, the national anthem at the Pan Am Games, we've never heard of her name, Rose Robinson. So for all the icons in the black community about black men being uh, I, you know, sort of symbols of resistance it's been black women that's been doing it for a very long time. Uh, I also, I just want to rem remind folks again, we have a plenty of opportunity for questions um, that you can put into your chat. Um, I want to turn back to, uh, to Caleb um, and come back to just, um, some of the filmmaking and uh, just talk with you a little bit about some of the images that you chose um, to render Nate's songs into what became this, this film. Um, I mean, there's so many we can unpack, um, but, uh, you know, the white face and the blindfolds, you know, and Nate and those characters uh, mouthing and singing the song together, uh, singing um, in, in two different instances um, was incredibly powerful to me. Um, Nate gently wiping down uh, the police officer in the midst of the protesting chaos. Um, and then the final scene when the real or phantom cop um, and Nate are both humming in the back of the police car, another really powerful um, choice that you made. Can you talk a little bit about just uh, what inspired you to come up with some of these images? If you want to talk a little bit about what they mean to you and Nate together, and maybe Nate, if you want to chime in a little bit about the decision uh, to render your songs into these be be beautiful visual images. I'm just really curious about um, that piece of, of the artist uh, artistic process. Yeah, I'll try to touch on all that. <laughs> uh, Sorry, just, no, 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 I'll try, man. And it's, and it's hard too, because I feel like even, you know, Nate knows this, sometimes when you're in the art, you're just kind of channeling the spirit and then you get like five months later and people are like, you know, what were you doing? And you're like, oh man, hold on, I have to go check back in and figure out, like to put words to what felt sometimes more like intuition and more mm -hmm. like um, a sense of guidance. Um, but mm -hmm. Dr. Dyson, I so every time I see you pop up, man, I so appreciate your thoughts on everything. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And just, I mean, you're, you're such a joy. Um, thank you so much. And, and Chelsea, your observations about, um, about Nate as a kid and, and, and were, were really, um, really struck me. And that was a lot of what I felt too, um, going through that footage as well. Um, it was, it was uh, really um, kind of like a, a, a pilgrimage, I think almost um, going through that footage and watching um, someone's life unfold over over you know eight nine years and 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 those changes into the person you know that I made I knew now but then going back and seeing you know that story um, and uh, uh, I think I think it was um, being able to contextualize um, Nate in his whole humanity um, not as a singular point in time and space uh, was part of this to maybe give what he was trying to communicate a little bit you know like um, more, more weight, more understanding for people coming into his music. Uh, the, the images, um, the images came from, I think of a few different places. Uh, the first half kind of developed back and forth. Nate and I went back and forth in this stuff. And, and, you know, if you think about the first half and the second half and the first half, you have people who don't have eyes, they just have mouths. And the second half, you have people who don't have mouths, they just have eyes. Um, so this is a really intentional inversion. Um, and the first half is sort of, you know, I, what, what, I, what I would call the dream and the second half is the nightmare. Um, you mm. kind of think that you're leaving the dream. It feels mm. suddenly real. And then, mm. you know, but the colors are weird. There's something off. 
and then it's not you know there's this nightmarish aspect so in in the in the first uh half of this i think when i when I first like sort of throw those image out of like people in the windows, it wasn't really developed. It was just people kind of in the windows watching. That was like the first initial idea and they had things over their eyes. And, um, and, and there was something of, of uh, you know, just being on the coast. And I think um, talking with people who say a lot um, in terms of like support and allyship, but, but maybe don't, I don't feel like um, experience sort of some of the realities of this or maybe come from an economically privileged place or like whatever. And, and kind of, feeling maybe a little bit frustrated towards some of my uh, elite or white peers around that. Um, mm. And uh, that was sort of the starting point um, of that. But then it developed into this idea of these, these sort of effigies kind of beginning to sing with Nate and you're like, oh, so there's sort of backup singer effect, but then they start taking, you know, the init initial idea was that they would start taking over for him. They would start mm -hmm. singing for him. And that was something that I felt a little bit uncomfortable about in all of the rush to support, which is a great thing. Sometimes this sort of like commandeering of like a voice in a way, um, which was something that I was super sensitive to the entire time making this. Like at the end of this, someone's going to be like, all right, all right, dude. Like, uh, so how did you show up here? <laughs> you know, what brought you to do this story? Um, so like, uh, I was thinking about that a lot, how, you know, where I could get out of the way and make sure I wasn't injecting too many, I could be honest, as an artist, but not c control something away from who Nate was and what was true to him. Um, and then I think it kind of developed into this third stage with what Nate and I were talking about as we started rehearsing, which is that we moved away from this idea of them just taking over his voice. And we moved into something of like, these are sort of dehumanized, you know, people who are present. Um, and, and, and does it get complicated when you start, when you attempt almost in like music video backup singer fashion, if you attempt to humanize a person that wasn't designed to be humanized. Mm. Um, things suddenly mm. get complicated and that's what happens. Um, everything's fine and good and they're sort of there. And then the moment Nate starts sort of peeling back this, you know, this facade, this visage, um, suddenly there's all this resistance and things blow up. And then, you know, we kind of shot this, you know, knife in the dark by making this sort of cross, cross comparison to a protest. And part of that, um, I guess for me, we know, and again, Nate and I talked through a lot of these images, but um, was that I recognized getting like really working um, with Nate through this, that looking back at that song in the same way that I would look back at an old film, um, I see all, I see the person that I was, I see the things that like make me roll my eyes. I see all the areas that I've learned and grown and changed sometimes for good, sometimes for worse. Um, mm. And uh, I know that for Nate looking at that track felt um, not where he was right now. Um, it felt like something like a little bit too simple, um, a little bit too easy. And so to me, the, the, the responsibility of the film and the images were to reflect where Nate was now um, while, while, while showing you a song that he wrote then. And that's kind of where that entire conflict um, is really to me was an attempt to express, express in the dream form the conflict that I heard and, and experienced talking to Nate around this stuff, around this song, around this desire to humanize, but also the reality of like someone pinning you to the ground and beating the shit out of you. Like, how do you, how, mm. how can you do those two things? It's not easy. And, you know, I, I obviously did not grow up black, but I grew up in a poor neighborhood where I got, you know, bullied by police all the time and I hated them. And, you know, uh, so I had that, I know what that, at least what that feels like to, to feel like, you know, the moment a cop car rolls by, you just suddenly, you're paranoid and you're trying to not do anything wrong that, you know, we used to be on skateboards and they, if you're on a skateboard, you're, you know, you know enemy of society in Michigan. Um, so it's not the same thing, of course, but it's like, um, but I know like that, that tension. Um, and then, uh, and then obviously as we, you know, moved into the second half and the end, there was a lot of conversations about uh, that end scene and, um, and about what that was and, and um, what it meant and, dialing it dialing it in and and um i think it's sydney sydney lamette the director who did um you know network and 12 angry men um he has a book and he, and he said um, all all great art is is self-revelation mm -hmm. um and i think that um for both nate and i going through this we weren't coming into it with um with like um a moral to this story or like something to tell people or believe this but rather like all of these questions as artists um, all of these questions is just human beings living in this country at this time. 
um, and trying to take questions that feel sometimes they just get compressed into two dimensionality through media and through kind of like um, these dehumanizing narratives and, 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 and just stretch them out and just render the question and the reality in its most frustrating complexity, its most uncomfortable complexity, even if you can't quite put words to it, um, because sometimes you can't. As, as Dr. Dyson said so beautifully earlier, it's like art has this chance to, and, and I'm gonna paraphrase and I might get this wrong, but I think he was saying art has this chance to kind of um, uh, fill out a question in a way. Um, to fill out reality a little bit more, where so much of the media and stories that we see, they're, they're, they're just, they want to collapse it and, and tell you that it's just simple. Um, and uh, so um, I, I think that that image to me was, um, for me personally, because uh, I, I can only speak to that, because I think Nate and I were often working through feelings, trying to find where it clicked for both of us, where we both feel something without being like, drawing out a whole chart of this means this, and this means this, and this is, you know, this is the article. We just write an article if we just wanted to do it that way, you know? Um, but, uh, I, but yeah, I think that there's something that is um, troubling and unsettling and it hurts me whenever I see that last image. Um, I don't like it. Um, and, um, and I think that there's something about the colors, the, the red, the black, and the blue, um, the blood and the bruises. Um, that's part of my favorite book is Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. And that book explores the soul of America, I think, in a way, a soul that's sort of built on violence. Um, and, uh, and there's something there about, the, I think, the spirit of this, um, this kind of twisted relationship between um, someone who's been hurt by someone. And, you know, the, 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 the oppressor or the, or the um, you could say, the perpetrator and, and the victim. And that this um, frustrating, um, like they become a part of you anyone who's, I've been hurt in my life and the people who've hurt me have become a part of me. Um, and that's, uh, and there's days where I've been the villain and I've been the hero in the same day too. Um, and that's, that's, hard to, that's hard to face, I think, to yourself. Nate, I'd like to uh, just get you into that because those are really interesting comments from, from Caleb there um, as it relates to the images and how your songs got turned into the moving image. Um, I mean, I'd start by just asking sort of what were some, even as a observer, um, of someone who created this, but now looking at it, what were some of the more powerful images for you? Um, and, and maybe in that answer, you can also tell us a little bit about how you came up with some of those images in, 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 um, in, in togetherness with, uh, with Caleb. Yeah, so Caleb was really good at um, pitching ideas to me and making like, he was like, how do you feel this would come off? How do you feel this would come off? And um, we would speak about a lot of, um, we would speak about how different, um, he came out with a lot of different artistic visions, but um, like thinking about particular scenes, like the scene with me wiping off the cop's face and the hands coming to, the hands uh, covering me up. Yeah. Um, One of my favorites. I felt, um, um, I felt like with writing truce and like looking at writing truce being like three, four or five years later type thing, looking at it, it was like, even if I give as much love as possible, what is going to happen next? Like, is there an amount, certain amount of love that's going to stop from what happens directly after me trying to wipe these cops face, these, this marking off of the cop? Um, like me being tackled by the police officers, like would, is there a, is there anything that could possibly stop it? And in the in the enough, it's the opposite. It's on some like, but like if I am about to like, like I'm frustrated and I'm finally fed up. I am so fed up. And we were in the streets this summer, and the, we, people are in the streets every day, fed up and tired every single day. And yet, people like Brianna Taylor's the person who murdered Brianna Taylor was still let go. Like. I have friends who were like I, everybody was calling and registering and in in the streets talking about say her name every day type thing and they still did this. so what is the amount what could possibly and we we're trying it was a lot about asking those questions. Hmm. And and what about the um, one of the other ones that um, uh, was incredibly powerful for me was the the choice of, um, and I'm gonna come to you, Dr. Dyson, because I wanna ask you about this, but the choice of the of you, Nate, 
running from this fandom or real cop, however you want to interpret it, but the white members of, you know, but the white society couldn't see that phantom. Like you just saw you running around like you were crazy, um, which to me was the invisibility of uh, certain sectors of our society and either not believing black folks when they talk about, you know, um, the things that uh, plague them or, um, or perhaps, gosh, look at that, you know, making people, black people feel they're crazy um, for saying this is what's happening to us. Um, just tell us a little bit about that experience of, of doing that scene and also what comes up for you um, in that rendering of that, of that, uh, of that scene. Yeah, I wasn't really thinking of the cop as a phantom cop. Okay. Uh -huh. And when I watched the film, I didn't think uh -huh. of it was a phantom cop. I thought yeah. it was just a cop. And yeah. for yeah, some yeah. reason, other people couldn't see it. Yeah. But like, I don't know. Um, it, uh, it, it, I think it hits both ways type thing because it makes me like, I feel like a crazy person all the time watching the news and being like, are you not mad? And people being like, relax. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Dr. Dyson, one of the things I wanted to ask you, I know you have to go in a few minutes, um, mm -hmm. is, you know, some of the themes that uh, come up are these issues of mental health um, or perhaps what's the perception of mental health? Um, I, you know, you can read those, some of these scenes in a number of different ways as it relates to, was the cop real, was it not real? Was it real to a black person, not real to a white person? Or, um, you know, be made felt as black people that often the things that we experience in, in the racial space, like we're crazy, like it can't be that because, you know, America is good and great and, and there's no way these things could happen to you. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about what came up for you on, on that level of not mm -hmm. only sort of the issues of the duality that obviously African-Americans live with, um, but also these issues of uh, what that can do to the black psyche. Um, and as at least I interpreted some of the things that, that was being, that were rendered in that second half of the film. Yes, sir. Well, look at the, the exchange between you and brother Nate just around the perception of whether it was an ophthalmological problem <laughs> in terms of the optics, you just couldn't be seen. Little Nate says, yo, I, I just thought they didn't, you know, just, just didn't see him, right? It didn't have any metaphoric intensity. And yet, um, maybe that's what happens generationally. You know, mm. I'm an old guy, <laughs> you're you're barely middle aged. You're a young you're a young middle aged guy, and then he's a young man. We've got the you know highly intelligent and intense, uh, you know uh, intensely poetic uh, sister Miller, and of course uh, the insightful brother Slain, along with this great young artist. And look at the generations. Look at how it peels off. Maybe in one generation, what is offensive in another generation becomes innocuous. Mm -hmm. And maybe what we see, what we hear, always, always conditioned by our experiences. You know, we got Ralph Ellison in, in, in mind, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. We got the invisibility. And, and what's the fourth sentence of that novel? It's not that I'm invisible because, you know, it, it, because people refuse to see me, <laughs> right? Um, and then you got most deaf. I know y'all don't, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up some old school, you know, what's his new name now? Uh, Yasin Bey, <laughs> but he said, invisible man, got the whole world watching, speeches my hammer, bang the world into shape, now let it fall. So the thing is, is that, is that for brother Nate, an ophthalmological problem, an optical problem, is infused in your generation, my generation, with uh, a deliberate attempt not to see or the inability to even observe because we've been rendered persona non grata. We don't even matter. We don't even show up. We don't even register. So I, I was struck like you uh, by the fact that, that that lack of visibility, that lack of being seen, that optical illusion so to speak, does have something to do with, with our mental health. Cause he's like, like brother Nate just said, do you, do you, do you see this? Um, I think Elizabeth Alexander has an essay, uh, one of the former uh, inaugural poets for, uh, for Obama uh, and now head of the Mellon Foundation has an essay 
about Rodney King. Can you be black and see this and watch this so that the trauma of optical illusions, the trauma of optics of seeing is that it renders us so vulnerable to what we see that we don't want to see it any longer. My generation, we have no trigger warnings. Mm -hmm. The only trigger warning we had is the trigger about to be pulled on the, by the cop. That's the trigger warning. Get out the way. There was no, there was no, you know, way in which we warned each other in an ethic of self-care against the re repeated exposure to trauma, because to see that trauma and to acknowledge that trauma at least said, see what I'm saying? Somebody else is experiencing that. See what I'm saying? That's the hurt and pain we got. Whereas the younger generation wisely says, no. Let's not expose ourselves repeatedly to that trauma because we re-traumatize ourselves because at the end of the day, if we can't do anything about it, what is the purpose of seeing it? It's a pornographic characteristic of black life. When Brother Nate talks about pornography, here's another element of pornography. The way in which the fetish of black death, the fetish of black flesh dying, the fetish of black death being snuffed out. These are snuff films perpetrated by, you know, or, or seen as a snuff film by a dominant white supremacist culture and logic and, and optics that sees the death of black flesh as a necessary condition of white existence. So in that sense, pornography and thanatopsis, pornography and death are related there. I don't want to get neo Freudian or even young in, but I'm just saying that's what it is. That's what pops out. So yeah, I think that invisibility and, and, and the problem with so many young people is not invisibility, it's hypervisibility. Damn, they see us everywhere, right? They, they see us as a threat, as a menace. They see us coming everywhere. And I can imagine in relationship to the, 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 the poignant question you raised, uh, Brother Chris, about, about the fact of mental health and stability. Are we really sane? Do we see what we think we see? Is there some kind of psychopathology going on that makes us hypersensitive? That, that you know, it's like, um, you know, when, when one of these Woody Allen movies, when, you know, he sees anti-Semitism everywhere. Did you, did you see what I'm saying? See, he said he's anti-Semitic. He said, did you, did you, did you, did you see what I'm saying? It was kind of funny, but then you think, wow, is that right? Because as they used to say, just because I'm paranoid don't mean ain't nobody after me. Mm -hmm. So just because conspiratorial thinking exists, in fact, what we saw with the mass conspiratorial thinking of a dominant white supremacist culture is even when they in charge, even when relatively speaking, they run stuff, they still have the illusion that they ain't running nothing. But so they buy into conspiracy as a way to justify their anti-democratic small d assault upon the rest of the nation because it has to be justified and in justifying it, they think we ain't got no power. So when we look at ourselves through the lens of mental health, uh, are we stable? We've been seen as unstable. We've been seen as destabilizing forces. It, question, it makes us question, can I stay sane? And I think when uh, Sister Miller brilliantly alluded to uh, the, the adultification of black youth, right? They've done studies that say what? Black youth are seen as being older than they are when they're young. So when you got Tamir Rice and the cop rolls up on a 12 year old kid, they're seeing him as 18, 19, 20 and menacing because of what they perceive to be his size. And because they've already added years uh, to his life in through their fear, then he's treated as an adult. Now ain't that a trip? At the same time, they treated Obama like a boy, they treated Tamir Rice like a man. <laughs> That's the crisscross. So the, the point is, I think, that yes, mental health is critical. Mental well-being is a and mental wellness are all internal dilemmas and dynamics and discourses we have, we are forced to have as black people or as as uh, you know, people in a majoritized culture when we are minoritized, when we are racialized, when we are seen as marginal, and then we have to ask ourselves, are we hypersensitive? Are we making it up? Do we generate discourses of defensiveness that mask our being out of touch with reality? Or are we so deeply and profoundly in touch with reality that others don't have to see, right? Uh, one of these French philosophers talked about things that others don't have to deal with. 
of things that you can't not see. And so we have to deal with stuff that we cannot see, that we can't not see. We have to see it. We are forced to see it. We are forced to come to grips with it in way that the dominant culture isn't. And therefore they, out of even generous consideration for our health, ask, are you all right? Are you sure you're saying that? Are you not making it up? Are you not exacerbating the tensions by your constant attention to it? As opposed to saying, it's so deeply entrenched in the culture that it's invisible to you, but every day the chain, the shackle, the limit uh, is apparent to those of us who have to live within them. I didn't want to go on, but I, I, so you raise a very provocative uh, issue there. D Dr. Dyson, I think we're up on your time. It's 5.15. So I just want, so first of all, I wanted to thank you um, mm -hmm. for uh, your analysis and for everything that you always bring to these issues. Just wanted to give you an opportunity to just talk a little bit about what you're up to. I think you have a latest you know, book just came out that you just yes, sir. published again. So just talk a little bit about what you're up to and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you go uh, and on to the next event. Yeah, I hate that I got to go. If I didn't have an event, man, I want to hang out with y'all. I don't want to. I hope the other people ain't looking. <laughs> we'll, we'll be on Clubhouse later if you want to stop by for what it's worth. <laughs> y'all got it, man. Y'all got you it. So much, you know, brother, brother, brother Caleb's, brother Nate, uh, sister, sister Miller. I, just tremendous young people. I want to keep in contact with all y'all. So all y'all email me or find me online or something. Let's, let's hook up. But yeah, I've got a book out now called, um, you know, uh, long time coming, which is an allusion, of course, to the Sam Cooke song. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know a change's gonna come. So uh, reckoning with race in America. And the point is I'm writing letters to martyrs. You know, I feel like, you know, I could have uh, brother Caleb and, and brother Nate, you know, and sister Miller, you know, and brother Chris just get together and do some stuff on my stuff. You know, let's, <laughs> let's, let's make it visual. Let, <laughs> let's, let's begin to articulate a visual aesthetic and an optic uh, engagement with what I'm trying to do literarily, because what I'm trying to do is to make people see, see the humanity of George Floyd, see the humanity of Ahmaud Arbery, see, as Sister Miller was speaking about, the humanity of Breonna Taylor, see the humanity of Sandra Floyd, see the humanity of Emmett Till, see the humanity of Elijah McClain, see the humanity of Reverend Clemente Pinckney, because the absenting of their humanity, the absenting of their fundamental decency and respect as human beings is all but missing. And as Sister Miller talked about, we're not talking about the kind of manipulation of the politics of respectability, right? Where people have to put forth narratives that disclose their essential goodness so it can justify them not being treated so barbarically. Ain't nobody got to do nothing but live and breathe to not be treated unjustly and unfairly. But in our culture, because we've been smeared posthumously, oh, Mike Brown was stealing some cigarillos. They don't go get the other film that showed he was exchanging a bag of weed for the cigarillos and he was snatching his weed and saying, give me my stuff, give me what you owe me. So now the narrative thickens, uh, the trajectory of truth broadens and we began to see, that's why art is so important. We began to see other elements we ain't willing to see before. So my book tries to get at those issues, talk about the dehumanizing impulse of white supremacist logic that undercuts the legitimacy and validity of black people. And to talk about how law enforcement and police brutality and, and, and police folk along with other white vigilantes have really unleashed on American society some of the most, um, destructive narratives and destructive practices that undercut us as human beings. And ultimately we want to live out e pluribus unum, out of many one. We wanna have unity. We wanna have people coming together, but not at the expense of truth, not at the expense of justice. Unity is a bridge, right? Unity is the bridge, justice is the destination, right? They weren't, they weren't celebrating the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They're celebrating Amelia Boynton and John Lewis for going over that bridge. Because by going over that bridge, named, by the way, after a, a Confederate hero, the point was that we're going to challenge uh, the, the lethal limits imposed by a police force that had already dehumanized Black people. And as a result of that, we're trying to make an argument for the franchise, for the ability of black people to vote. So we ain't worshiping bridges, we are worshiping destinations. <laughs> We're trying to get somewhere. 
And if we only worship unity, oh, we're all unified. No, we ain't. And if we are, it's problematic. The people on the Capitol were unified in mm -hmm. their purpose to undermine American democracy. So <laughs> unification by itself is not a legitimate and valid end. It is pointing toward an instrumentality toward something bigger and deeper and broader. So that's the stuff I got. I, I wish I could stay on, you know, <laughs> trade some more lyrics with y'all, do some freestyles and whatever. But uh, it's been an honor thank and you a privilege. So much, and I sir. thank you for inviting me to, to, to hang out with y'all a little bit. Absolutely. What a word, Dr. Dyson. What a word. Thank you so thank you. much, sir. Thank, thank you, man. Love what y'all are doing. Love what you're doing. Sister Miller, too. Love what you're doing. So I hope we can stay in contact, Brother Chris. Let's, 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 let's offline get together and let's do some stuff together. I would love to hang out with y'all some more. Okay, right on. We'll talk it's a to privilege, soon. doctor. God bless you now. God bless. Take good care. God bless you, ma'am. Miss Miller, take good care now. Yes. You too. All right, we'll, we'll connect. We'll connect. Yes. Speaking, Thank y'all. Speaking of, speaking of Sister Miller, um, uh, Chelsea, tell me a little bit about just from as an activist, um, and we're going to get to audience questions right after Chelsea uh, answers this. But I um, just want to make sure we got another question into you about how uh, films like this that are so powerful and render so, some of our experiences so beautifully, how do they how do they help your work or how can you use them in your work, um, you know, on the streets? Because you are, you know, in the trenches every day. Uh, you're, Young person, 24, 25, you've got a you know, long your whole life ahead of you to do this work. But I'm just curious about how art and, and specifically films like this can be helpful to you um, as a tool um, as you go out into many of your spaces to continue uh, to create change and justice. Yeah, of course. So first and foremost, Nate, you're awesome. Um, and same, everyone who who supported in, in this film, like as I was watching it, I was like, yes, like there was so many just elements that, that Caleb artistically really came together in the piece that to me just resonated a lot, especially being an activist and being on the front lines. And I remember the first time going out was after the death of George Floyd. And we were all seeing so much black pain, black trauma, black death and being in the middle of it, right? Um, also, at the same time, as you are leading people in the front lines, you are also facing the very serious reality of what's right in front of you. And it is oftentimes the manifestation of this very police state that we are talking about. It is the coming together in a lot of ways of history and the present um, to see so many police officers in riot gear, to see police choppers in the air as we are organizing and on the ground and you ask yourself, am I not human? Am I not also a citizen? Am I also not worth protecting, right? Um, all of these questions that come to your head. And one of the things that we always say on the front lines is we protect us we got us. We have street medics. We have bikers. I don't know if anyone has been to a New York protest, if anyone's based in New York, anyone's listening to New York, but if you know anything about our New York protests, and, and I'm talking about the organizers who we work with within our network, it is some of the most organized protests that you will see in this country, period. We have bikers who are trained, who stand in front of protesters. We have food supplies. We have, um, there are organizations and just collectives on the front lines who do mutual aid. And so we're able to get um, New York City bodegas that are on the go following the protests as they're happening, right? Um, these very real things that we talk about when we see community and what that looks like. And so for me, when I see Nate's coming of age, in a lot of ways, I see the movement and I see what the movement is fighting for. And I see the importance of showing up. And I was actually doing an interview yesterday with CBS for Black History Month. It's, it's a piece that's coming out. And one of the things that I was talking about was the importance of why are we doing this work right now? What motivates you? I talk about all the time that it was in the middle of the summer and at that point I hadn't been home in two days and I just broke down in a friend of mine's bathroom because I was just so overwhelmed and I was tired and it was hot and the sun was blistering and we were outside and you didn't know when 
you were going back home. You didn't know what was going to happen when you went outside, right? Um, and so the weight of the world felt like it was on my shoulders and I just broke down. And the only reason why I kept going was because of the, the movement is because of the young people who are coming behind us is because of the younger Nates who currently are watching what our generation is doing and, and is coming of age and is having dreams of police officers coming to get them in, in their nightmares and, and is having to really reckon with who am I and what is my value in, in this world. And I think for me, it's so important to show those younger people coming up that your value is intrinsic to you and you are a leader within your own right and you deserve justice and you deserve to be here. And so that's why we show up. We show up for the Nates. And, and so that's what the piece helps us do in the movement, to humanize the movement, to tell the stories of what we are fighting for, and to show that it's not just about the Black trauma, but it's also about Black celebration. It's also about Black life. It's also about Black joy. It's also about Black art. And so that all comes together in my work. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Um, I just want to turn to a couple questions from the audience. Um, uh, let's see, Amanda Miller. Um, I love this film and it makes me want to do something. What can people do to help support your message? And what is the best way to share the film online and on social media? So let's, uh, let's have Caleb and Nate. Nate, let's start with you, um, just in terms of strategy and, um, and that's from Amanda Miller, um, that question. Yeah, the film, the post, um, you can share the film all over your social medias, all over Facebook, all over Instagram, all over Twitter. We'll be sharing it on Instagram TV soon as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, um, Caleb, could you help me out? Uh, I, I mean, yeah, the most, I think the most obvious way to share it is like, you know, grab a link and send it to people, whether it's on your social or like, I mean, straight up email, email text it to people, right? Like, I don't spend much time on social media. So my social media is texting. If I want someone to see something, I text it to them, um, so text it to people uh, if that's what matters. And if you want to support us, it's like, yeah, we've been doing this kind of on a, on a smoke and a dream since the beginning. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, we've had, we've had a bit of support through our GoFundMe and we still need a lot. It's gonna be a long road of, of bringing this film around the country, of showing it to, to places through film festivals, um, even kind of finishing up some of the stuff to continue um, building out the face of the film as we go into, you know, um, we didn't make this film expecting to trying to win an Oscar or anything like that, but you know, we, 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 it's crazy that it, it has become, you know, is now an Oscar qualified film. So um, Academy voting does count and we do want to, I mean, get the word. If you know a journalist, reach out to a journalist, you know, if you know someone who can write a story, reach out to that person. If you know someone who's looking for a project to support, um, you know, a, like an, an art project to support, we could use a little bit of help. You know, we're, 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 we're a little bit in debt right now. So um, why we had the GoFundMe set up. Um, but yeah, we wanted to, you know, we put our, we put our hearts and souls into this. I think Nate and I could both say that. Um, uh, long, long, long nights of conversation. I mean, Nate and I would be on the phone for hours at night, like talking through stuff, you know, trying to, trying to figure out, do we feel good about this? What's the right thing to do, you know, even all the way through post. So um, yeah, we've been through it. So thank you, Amanda, for even asking that, but yeah, any support you offer uh, means a lot to us. I think there's a GoFundMe link that's in the YouTube universe, I believe, but just in case there isn't, um, the film enough does have enough film does have uh, a GoFundMe page that you can Google if you go on your GoFundMe and find a place to contribute. Um, Amanda, uh, uh, Chelsea, let me ask you also about that question. Uh, Amanda asks, um, you know, what can people do to support this message? And, um, you know, you're the, the activist amongst us, um, just given everything you know about the film, the spirit of the question and sort of what you're up to, I don't know where Amanda is, but um, how would you answer that question just generically? Yeah, I would say to amplify the, the story and I would say not just amplify the story, but make sure that you are having those really critical conversations about how it connects to the movement and what does it look like to show up in real time. I always say that you can't 
check someone else without also having that very serious conversation about how does this apply to your own truth before you then share it with the world and say, you know, everyone should watch this, this piece. The question is, what does this piece mean to you? And how are you going to apply it in your life? Because I think that it's also something that's very powerful about art, right? It's that ability to take it and then make it real for you. And I think that there's something powerful to be said about that. Um, so that's what I would definitely encourage. Use this as, as somehow a way to learn and grow in the way that feels the most authentic to who you are. And then similar to what Caleb has said, sharing it within your networks, having those conversations with family and friends, not just on social media, but even those closest to you. Because what I will add is that there are a lot of people and allies who are on the front lines who will scream Black Lives Matter, but go home back to their dinner tables with their problematic white fathers and mothers and grandparents um, and not say anything. So it's really important to make sure we are having these conversations behind closed doors as well. And it's a short piece. So absolutely, you know, share it with folks. Um, let's see. Rachel asks, sorry, let me just get up to it. Rachel Whittle asks, uh, how did you decide uh, on the ending of Enough? Uh, what is the message you'd like viewers to take away? So I'll leave that for uh, Caleb and Nate. Um, I, I think Nate should, uh, maybe I'll say it first and then I think Nate okay. should give your own answer because as two artists, I think that the yeah. best part about this collaboration is we, we're gonna have two different answers on a lot of this Absolutely. stuff. That's, that's, it's good. Um, so, I mean, I kind of joked about this earlier, but I always say like, I don't, I don't like, um, I don't really like messages. I like questions um, and, you know, um, and unearthing something and maybe just showing something. Um, so I don't think that I have like this sort of statement. Um, I think if I had that, I would have just made like maybe a really big sign or <laughs> bought up some ad space or something like that. <laughs> um, but uh, I, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna think about it a moment more if there's okay. maybe, I don't wanna be totally aloof, but, but okay. Nate, do you have an answer? Nate, your thoughts about um, what message you'd like the viewers to take away and why did you decide on the ending of Enough? So let's make it back to my question about the cop and the and you humming together uh, in the back seat. Um, I would, because we, we went back and forth about plenty of parts in this film for a while. And um, that scene particularly was hard and it's hard to watch like I don't like seeing myself in the back of a cop car like I don't like I don't like seeing myself being chased by a cop in general but um and nothing about me would want to be in the back of the cop car with <laughs> the cop that had been chasing me the entire process of it and I don't know like I um I think the entire process of writing the songs and doing the film and um, just try working towards the movement is like, what could I, what can I possibly do to be like, what, like I have a lyric in one of my songs for the project that I'm working on attached to this. Um, if my greatest weapon is my pen, what's it I must say to find a way to make this end? And if, like, like, is there enough protests that we'll go to that like, we'll stop? I don't necessarily know what the answer is to this. It mm -hmm. was just, it's just, I don't know. It's just a question like, what am, what am I enough? Am I doing enough? Cause I've had enough. Like we're all tired of mm. seeing that imagery. Mm. 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 I get it. It's and I think, and I would add to that too. Um, I think what's hard about this question is that I don't feel that that, that last scene is the sort of takeaway. Um, I think the last scene is almost a coda, um, mm -hmm. almost a statement about the, the country itself um, in an image, um, mm -hmm. part of its spirit. Uh, but I think that the piece itself um, is, everything is about humanization. Mm -hmm. I've just been so um, depleted by the, the media in this country um, and it's sort of incentive structure, um, and it's incentive structure, you know, around some of the most difficult conversations and how it renders those, you know, in their most sensationalized and exasperated form. 
Um, and for me, I'm always trying to get back to like, what is the person on the other end of this? What's the humanity of the person involved in this? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for, and in this situation, that was, that was, that was Nate, um, that was um, his story. So I think if I wanted you to take away anything, I think it's just his humanity um, and his humanity in so far as um, how these aspects, these realities of our country has shaped his humanity over the course of his childhood you know, um, contributed to his loss of innocence as we all experience a loss of innocence, but this is his story. Um, so that's, that's what I would like. Yeah, yeah, right on. Um, question for you, uh, Chelsea. Um, if you had a video journal of yourself growing up and could watch it now, what do you think you'd see? In what ways would it resemble or differ from what you saw of Nate in the film? That's a great question. It's a great question. Got to go deep on this. Really good. <laughs> I'm like, yikes. Okay. Y'all really are trying to have me unpack. Um, I think that there would actually be a lot of similarities. Interestingly enough, I think that there's the recurring theme of becoming that I think that across the board is something we can all relate to. Identity, understanding self, the insecurities that come with the becoming who you are and, and not being sure, um, wanting to be accepted, right? Relationships with family. And so I know that growing up, I was always a bit of a troublemaker. I was the person that if the teacher said we were going left, I would tell the entire class to go right and probably get in trouble for it. <laughs> and so I think that my mischievous nature has definitely served me well over the years. And I think more so than anything, um, that spark of always questioning. I think that I've always been someone that has questioned why things are the way they are. I've always been someone who's questioned systems and this idea about authority, you know, um, who are we beholden to and why? And so I think in that way, it has shaped me into who I am. Um, and I remember being really young and when it was bedtime, waking up my other siblings and going on like little missions <laughs> with them, like, let's go to the fridge and take the rest of the dinner, <laughs> you know, like very ridiculous things that you do as a child that I think, um, in that way, there's something to be said about the curiosity of youth and continuing to bring that into your adulthood. Um, so yeah, I, I see a lot of similarities. And then of course my own experiences with police, especially this past summer and the ways that um, I witnessed firsthand the police state and also even in the midst of, of being directly in front and and leading thousands of people right um with police forces literally coming in our direction i think that to me is a reminder that it can happen at any time and i don't have the luxury of being a bystander i don't have the luxury of being silent i don't have the luxury of pretending so i don't see and so i think there's also something to be said about that what does it mean to be a black body taking up um, space within a society that is not designed for you to to exist in the way that you are in your full and entire self um, I have a question from Rick Stevenson, who is the grand pooba of all of this, I think, a lot of ways. Um, I'll start with you, actually, Kelsey, uh, Chelsea, and, and see what the other uh, fellows think. Uh, will there ever be such a thing as a post-racial society? And I would add, actually, should there be um, a post-racial society? Is that something we should strive for? So, Chelsea, what do you think? A post-racial society, I would say that this is interesting because immediately when I think about this, I reflect on the work of Fred Hampton and the Rainbow Coalition that he was building before his death. Um, he was an incredible organizer, he was extremely young when he was assassinated by the FBI. And so to that point, I would say that the goal is always to be able to step out of the constructs of white supremacy because we have to understand that, you know, a lot of times people say, well, slavery existed before America. And let's be very clear that slavery during the Roman times 
was very different from chattel slavery and generational slavery that was designed in America tied to the capitalist system as a way to create an inferior class. Um, an incredible piece that I would recommend folks to read is a book called Cat, called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson that really talks about race as a social construct. Now with that being said, though race is a social construct, the realities of that is very, very real. 400 years, right, of systemic oppression that is still going on to this day, racism, hasn't changed, it has burrowed itself in our systems. And so when I think of a post-racial society, I think of post-racial to who, and also keeping in mind that we can't move past the point of post-racial without reckoning with all of the systems that have been designed in a racialized way, right, to subject um, Black folks, Black, Brown, and Indigenous folks. And so to that point, I would say that, of course, we all want to get to a point one day in the world where we can, right, see a, a post-racial world of, of equity and justice for all. But I would say that I do not want to do that at the expense of the work that needs to be done to undo racism. And so I will continue to be in a racialized society until we get to that point. Otherwise, we are kidding ourselves, right? Um, and we are being blind. We are being a part of the problem. Nate, what do you think? Um, I'm, I, I agree with Chelsea a lot, actually. Um, I think in order to reach a post-racial society, we have to reckon with all of the sins that this racial society has brought in us. And um, sure, we are looking, yeah, I, ideally, I would love to live in a world where we all look to the commonalities of one another and we're like, yup, that's cool. But as of now, it doesn't seem, I don't know, it doesn't, hopefully in my lifetime, we'll get to see it, hopefully. Caleb? Um, I would say my, my answer from this comes from, if anyone has studied um, uh, spiral dynamics um, and uh, Ken Wilber's integral theory in terms of social evolution and personal evolution. Um, and part of this concept is that as you evolve kind of through these states of society and both as a person towards these sort of more enlightened place, um, integral theory is that you don't, A, you don't get to skip levels and B, you don't get to erase all the way down to the most primal. You have to integrate and you can't, you know, be, you can't like hate these parts of yourself. You can't hate the, you know, you, you evolve and kind of develop. So we're at this level of sort of what's known on the, on the sort of in, within spiral dynamics as like post-modern um, or, or rather like human focused where we're reckoning with, you know, realities of people who are disenfranchised, people who have been abused, people have been, you know, um, who've dealt with tremendous amounts of racism or discrimination. Um, but it's like, if this, if society is going to keep going, it's like society does have to all come to that place and integrate it to move forward. And it's not that that goes away, it's integrated. It's just, we move into a more sort of integral place where those things maybe don't need to take up occupy so much of our attention, so much of our time, because we've, we've you know, done what we could to work through them um, generationally and also individually. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess back to the simple question, I don't think post-racial, it's always gonna be a part of our history and our growth. Um, but I think that there's a way that as we evolve to a place where that's almost like a beautiful hum, the differences, the differences of life and so forth that we're kind of in sync with each other over. That's, I, would, I would like to be in that, in that world. Uh, Chelsea mentioned the next, um, Fred Hampton and her answer to that question and, uh, or one of the past questions. One of the next great pieces of art coming out on February 12th, if anyone doesn't know about, is about Fred Hampton, Judas, uh, and the Black Messiah, which is executive produced by Ryan Coogler. So keep out for that. And I will speak to some of what Chelsea was talking about, about one of the great activists of our time who was cut down way too short, uh, 1968 or nine. nine. Um, question from uh, Ellen Marte um, for Nate. Do you believe that the visualization of these two songs would have been astronomically different 
if they weren't necessarily portrayed in a film such as this? So I think the question is, um, how did this, this particular rendering, uh, would it have been the same if you had done it another way? I think that's uh, the heart of the question. would be the same if we did it another way and like if we decided to I don't know if we made this a play instead but like it mm. felt like a, I, don't know. Mm. I, I think she might be I mean maybe I'm wrong about this maybe it is like a play I was thinking I, my thought was that she meant like um like if this were like two music videos you know if you just like did a, a vid visuals for the songs but that's yeah. interesting like the play yeah oh if we would no I think it was in, like it would have been different, completely different. Like think about it all the time. If we would have shot a video when we first shot, True, when we first made Truce, I don't think like it would have been all right or it might've been cool, but like, I think it hit way harder now or who knows, who knows? But I think it hit way harder now mm -hmm. knowing that, uh, knowing that this is where he was, this is where he's at and this is, how he got to the, all of, this is how we got to that conclusion. I think that story is a little stronger. So I'm glad we went with the story we decided to go mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. uh, our last question is from uh, Talis Kohler. Uh, Nathan and Caleb, how and why did you come up with the dream and nightmare just, juxtaposition? And you guys talked a little bit about that earlier, but uh, maybe you could uh, just unpack it a little bit about uh, coming up, I think, artistically with uh, these two um, different renderings um, of, of uh, Nate's experience. Nate, you want to start? Yeah. How did you come up I with? Say, yeah, sorry, good. I like the, um, I'm glad when Caleb came up with the idea with the dichotomy of the, a dream and a nightmare. Um, I think it really spoke to how hopeful I was. And you see that throughout watching me as a little kid, like I really want the best in the world, but like, it's hard to reckon with that. And like, I don't wanna say I feel bad for writing truths or I feel bad for having hope type thing. Right. But it's hard to deal with that. So I think the film does a really, really good job of like capturing the, I'm frustrated, but I want to hope, but I want to be frustrated, but I wanna, uh, Mm -hmm. It comes out loud and clear about the evolution and uh, dichotomy in your growing spirit. Caleb? Um, Henry Jaglum was a director in the 70s who was friends with uh, Orson Welles. And he was directing a, a movie and uh, he would have lunches with Orson um, kind of while shooting the film. And uh, he said at one point, listen, I'm frustrated. I go on set. I ask these guys, the camera guys to do stuff and they complain, they don't wanna do the shots that I wanna do. I wanna do kind of crazy angles. They tell me why it doesn't make sense for the story. And Orson said to him, he said, just tell them it's a dream sequence. <laughs> <laughs> just tell them it's a dream sequence. <laughs> and Jaglin went back on set the next day um, and, uh, and you know, asked to do a super low angle on something. He said, oh, it doesn't make sense. He said, no, it's a dream sequence. And they sat there and they go, oh, okay, 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 right. So there's this thing with dreams where we, we kind of let go of our idea, our certainty around what reality is, our certainty. Um, and I think certainty is, is a real problem today with the amount of information that we have. We have so much information, you forget all the information you don't have. Yeah. Um, I think we have a genuine pandemic of, of certainty. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to just render to, you know, if people remember when we filmed this in August, I mean, the, on top of the, just the political polarization of this country, but then, you know, everything that the George Floyd protests did in terms of like people basically like everyone's, everyone's has a shield and a sword, you know, it's just like they're waiting, you know, if they're not, if they're not fighting for something, they're waiting some, for, they're, you know, they're scared that someone's gonna come for them. They're prepared for that attack. And so part of, I think the beauty of dreams um, is that you can put down your weapons and maybe put down your armor for a second. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to not just preach to the choir of people who I think will you know, love Nate and understand his story, but also reach across the aisle to maybe someone who wouldn't, you know, who would put up that guard because it's like, okay, it's gonna come with all this political stuff and just kind of let them come in 
I think before the emotional reality comes into it too yeah. and not try to, you know, to demonize them or try to like tell them why they got it wrong, but just to put down, you know, lie in bed. I think, I think Werner Herzog said that, that like his favorite piece of art of like 2017 or 2018 was Kanye's video, video of all the people asleep in the bed, you know, together. Mm -hmm. And there's just something about this idea of sleep and how defense, you know, how vulnerable we are and that we all sleep and we're all, it's sort of innocent in this way. So, um, so I think that dreams and, and nightmares as well um, provide this space for sometimes to us to engage in ideas that um, in a different way that we might um, try to categorize or shove into boxes so we don't have to maybe deal with them in their full complexity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right on. So we're coming to the end of the program. I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. So I just wanted to ask everyone as we close out, uh, first of all, there isn't anything that I have, if there is anything I haven't asked you or something about the film, where we are in relation to the film as a society that you'd like to sort of close out with any closing thoughts um, just on uh, the art, the artists, uh, where we are, uh, the activism. Chelsea, I'm gonna start with you. Um, just uh, what are some closing thoughts just about this conversation we've had? And, uh, you know, and, and also if you could talk a little bit about what you're up to now and what you've got going, uh, coming into 2021. Yeah, absolutely. So my kind of parting words when it comes to everything that we've talked about is just continuing to stay plugged into the conversation and to continue to use art as a vehicle for healing, as a vehicle for finding places for us to, and, and this is a word that Nate's been using a lot, reckon right with our reality and also um, think through what, what next looks like within your own respective communities, but also the world. And I think that there's something really powerful about this idea of art imitating reality, but also the possibilities of reality being able to imitate art. And so in that way, how can we reimagine our world, right? And how can we think about new solutions to creating change? And then I would say with my work in particular, um, not only on social media, using that as a vehicle, but also in the streets. I was just at a protest yesterday, um, right? And so continuing to stay plugged into the movement and use your voice and your talents and gifts to be a part of the change. And you can find out more about my work at the Chelsea Miller on Instagram, at Freedom March NYC on Instagram, uh, because there's a lot more pressure that's coming from the young people on the front lines. I can tell you that. Right on. Caleb, what, what do you have, any farting, parting thoughts and uh, uh, thoughts about what you're doing, uh, what 2021 looks like, any other uh, work you'd like to share about what you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm writing a new, new piece right now and have a couple of um, uh, uh, scripts that are done and, and also uh, taking a, a break from that stuff to work on something new. And it kind of is a, a little bit of a closer step from this project, different, but um, I think it there are some things that I learned doing this that I want to apply into a different, a different story. Um, and, uh, I, but yeah, I think that f for us, you know, for Nate and I both, it's th today is the first, well, I mean, it's not the first day we've been at this for so long, but it's, <laughs> we're at the beginning of, you know, uh, quite a, quite a serious road in terms of not just bringing, um, you know, getting this out there as a, as a film and a piece of art, but also seeing, you know, taking responsibility for it and bringing it places and helping to instigate um, conversations that we think are worth having, that we think are, are not being had in terms of um, what art can do. And, and if everything needs to fit into this sort of like, you know, binary landscape that we've been living in for years. Um, and, uh, you know, and if we can start to, as Dr. Dyson said, start to, you know, so suture together um, a little bit of the fabric that's been torn apart and maybe, and, and, and in a much better way than it was even before uh, it was torn in some pieces that have never been, and have always been apart. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm a little bit underslept. We've been working hard to get this out, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, I mean, I, just anyone who wants to come along with us on the journey, whether you can, you know, whether you can support us getting, uh, getting out of debt at least first, uh, through our GoFundMe and, or if you can, um, just sort of, you know, um, be along with us to, to champion, to share and, and just express love. Um, I mean, it, it, it's the gasoline that we, that we need. Right on. Nate, um, any parting thoughts? And tell us a little bit about what you're up to uh, into your 21st year. Ah, um, yeah, I right now I am 
working diligently to finish the album that we wrote You're attached right. to enough. Um, the album's called Accountability Buddy, and that should be out pretty soon. Um, we're, um, I guess my thoughts would be, I write music and I decided to write um, Truths and Enough and all of my songs. I write songs in hopes that if I give my absolute self that somebody else will see that and be like, wow, he's willing to be as vulnerable as possible. Why can't I do that? I hope there's a little kid that's, I hope there's somebody in middle school or high school that's watching the Enough video and sees themselves in little Nathan growing up and sees themselves in Nathan the rapper deciding to put all of that in his pen or whatever your canvas decides to be. Like, I just hope that I I'm I want everyone to be as vulnerable as possible. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, um, this has been a fantastic conversation. I, I you know feel incredibly lucky to have been able to talk to everyone, including Dr. Dyson, Chelsea, Nate, Caleb. This is a fantastic conversation spawned by an incredible piece of art. Um, just want to remind folks if you um, if you, you may see everyone's uh, social handles and such at the bottom of the screen on your YouTube um, screen there. Um, and uh, please, please, please support this film any way you can. Like I mentioned, there is a, uh, a GoFundMe page that you can find. Um, I'm sure that link is in the YouTube as well. Um, but uh, that's all we got. I uh, want to thank you again for, uh, for, every, for the entire team here. Uh, it was a fantastic conversation. Thanks for hanging with us. It was a rich conversation. And I really appreciate the opportunity to meet all of you guys. So I hope we can continue to do this in another another forum, another venue. And maybe when Nate's entire album comes out, we can get together for it. It will be an opportunity to get together for the album release party on a Tuesday sometime in New York. So there you go. <laughs> Are they still doing that? Are they still doing album release parties? Maybe that's something for my generation. Maybe you guys don't do that. I think they're, they're like clubhouse album release parties now. Ah. I think that's, you know, everyone's, everyone's, everyone's releasing their album from their bathroom, basically, I think. Ah. Ah. There you go. On clubhouse it is. Good night, everybody. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Chelsea, so much, so much respect for you, by the way. Thank you so much for coming and sharing everything that you did. Um, just so, so eloquent and um, and just has so much insight. So thank you. And Chris, um, like I said, uh, just can't even say how much I appreciate you enough and 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 the how much thought you put into this conversation today. Really uh, means a lot to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys Good night, everyone. Bye, Nate. Good night, everyone. Bye, y'all. Resisting arrest, you restricted my breath, which you expect me to do. They took another.